One of the things that all of the, we interviewed literally hundreds of nurses and, and um, donut dollies, the, the USO people, and um, <clears throat> who were there. And, and one of the things we landed on quickly that the women on the writing staff were really insistent on, Pat Green as well was on the staff, was don't write women. Just write and let the women inhabit the character. Uh, we took it so far in ER that, that all of the characters in the first script with Michael Crichton did not have gender identifications. So nobody was anything other than their last name. Um, and so in talking to the women and hearing their experiences and all the men, because we were doing it at the same time, we realized that there were all of these universal experiences and they could be for the male character, they could be for the female characters, and we didn't try to distinguish between you know, which was which, unless it was a combat story where a man had to do it. All the other stories we were constantly fooling around with and saying, well, why does this have to be for this character? Could it be a, character, a story for that character? What would happen if we changed the gender of it? What's the specifics of it? Um, and that came, again, from interviewing lots and lots of people and hearing what they had to say. <clears throat> Out of that interview process, we actually also started to record them, you know, because of the, the uh, there were, you know, all those small video recorders that just kind of come on the market. Uh, and then we started looking at them all the time for our research and then said, well, why don't we just, like, make an episode of this? So we actually did shoot an episode that was very, one of the things we were all proudest of on the show, which was called Vets, which was literally the their stories and showing what we'd done with their stories. Um, you know, that was... Uh, really powerful and, and, and they feel real um, because they were real stories. And of course we had to you know, dramatize them in certain directions and things, but the voices came through because we'd heard them from real people. We weren't imagining them. We weren't making up things based on, um, on this sort of a, a pop referential. You know, I know that's true. I mean, it, it makes me a little crazy, but you know, I, I would oftentimes uh, challenge writers to say, why do you know that? Something in their script. And oftentimes, particularly in the procedural shows, whether it be medical shows or um, police shows, lawyer shows, they think they know it from television that they've seen. Like, well, that's what really happened. Well, no, it's not, because you haven't actually really talked to someone to find out what really happens. Mm -hmm. So I want to hear you tell me that you heard it from this specific person. I want you to do that research and know. Um, so that kind of having these conversations, these many, many conversations with the women who are actually there, who, you know, now are in their 60s and up 60s and 70s, but at the time were still, you know, in their 40s and, and even late 30s, and the experiences were very immediate, and showing us their pictures and talking about things they hadn't talked about and thought about for a long time was central to kind of getting this sense of, of, um, portraying uh, uh, what felt like a sort of an unseen part of that, uh, of that war. And the vets ones that I talked about that we did, which was really just honoring the real vets, which oddly enough, you know, when you're taking people's real stories and you're, you know, dramatizing them and turning them into kind of a narrative that needs to work for the characters that you have, sometimes you start to feel like maybe I've, maybe I have dishonored the story. So many of these stories, you know, someone was dead or someone had lost a leg, or someone was going through really the worst moment of their lives. And so we were constantly trying to say, are we really honoring the thing that was shared with us?